Welcome to our final session of Future Leaders. Again, my name is Emily Cabbage, and I have been your uh, NAPA staff host on this journey. So for those of you who are uh, participating live, we appreciate you taking the time out of your uh, busy summer schedules to spend a little bit of time with us during this journey through Future Leaders. And you know, we really hope that this has been uh, a useful information to you to help guide you as you consider a career in, uh, in insurance or financial services. Um, and I know that a lot of you who are watching this on demand, you know, maybe have not gotten an opportunity to engage at the same level as those of those participants who have been um, live, but, you know, do still feel free to reach out to any of our speakers on LinkedIn, um, reach out, make those connections, because that's that's really, um, if you've learned anything from these sessions, that's really one of the things that it's all about, is about being, um, making connections and and getting introductions to to those people who can help, um, help you with that career. And on that note, um, just going to kind of do a little bit of a plug for NAFA membership. And, um, you know, we've talked, everybody that's been on here has been members, are members of NAFA. And, you know, it really is a network that you get when you join. And for a student membership, it's only $50 for a, an entire year. And so you, you really get that access and exposure to these thought leaders. Uh, you know, we've just shown you a very small handful of the connections that you can make within NAFA. Um, and we just really encourage you to take advantage of that. And then, you know, if you are like, if you like this program, if it has been beneficial to you, uh, you know, talk to your professors, talk to your career centers, you know, talk about however you found this program, go back and let them know um, the value that you've had with this program and the opportunities that you've had be being able to talk to um, some of these thought leaders in, in the industry who are doing this job day in and day out. Um, and in the course that the path that they have taken to um, to get them to where they are today. And, um, you know, we just, we've got another fall session coming up. We've got a winter session. So, um, there's plenty of opportunities for more engagement. And, you know, at the end of all of this, you'll get a survey. And, you know, we do really want to hear your feedback on that and, and see how we can continue to grow and develop this program um, and kind of take it into the next steps. Because NAFA, membership in NAFA and this career path really is a journey. And we're all here for you to, um, to see you succeed. Um, so, that's kind of kind of my my little bit of pitch. Uh, Chris, are you ready, or do you need another minute? Okay, uh, it sounds like he might need another minute. So, um, so I guess while oh, there you you good? Yep. Okay, um, and you're still on mute, but <laughs> yeah. So. As I mentioned, this is our last session. So this week we have Chris Gandy, who is founder of Midwest Legacy Group, uh, which is part of the One America um, umbrella. And um, Chris has a great story um, to tell about, you know, how he got into the industry, the path that he took, um, and really has some really motivational um key pieces to share with you. So Chris, um, I'll let you, I've kind of done a little bit of an introduction. Chris is based in the Chicagoland area and um, and actually uh, his first career was nothing with an insurance and financial services. So Chris, why don't you do a quick introduction? Thank you so much, Miss Emily. I appreciate everyone being on this call. Emily, how many do we have today? Uh, today, right now, live, we've got four. There four, and we may have some more to dial in, which is uh, after Correct. the um, timing is everything. So um, thanks, Emily. So I know I have about 40 minutes today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit back of your day. Uh, I promise to have you out of here by noon Central Standard Time. Um, so if everyone can do me a huge favor, so I don't feel like I'm just talking to a blank screen, if it's possible, or if you're capable, if I could see your wonderful, wonderful faces would be fantastic. Hi, Tyler, Nathan, Kyle, if you have video, would love to see you. And um, uh, I think that's Yuri. If we could see Yuri, it would be great. So 
Um, good seeing all of you guys. I know Emily wants to get a picture of all of you guys too, because it's always great promotion of, of, of a great opportunity. So, all right. So with that being said, um, my name's Chris Candy. Um, I've been now in the business uh, for 23 years. In my previous life, she might've mentioned that uh, I played um, sports in college and then went on to play professionally. Um, I kind of bounced around that thing called basketball for a period of time and spent a little bit of time, uh, you know, in the NBA for a little bit, and then I played overseas for a couple of years and, and um, ended up somehow in insurance and financial services. And, you know, I, I think what led me to being in the insurance and financial services industry is the same thing that led me to sports is one you're 100% accountable for yourself too, is you can work as hard as you want. No one's going to stop you uh, for achieving whatever you want to achieve. And then three is that you can really accomplish anything you want if you just work harder than other people. So that was one of the things that kind of led me into the business. Now, it's not what keeps me in the business, but that's what led me into the business. So as you guys consider entering such a wonderful business model, I'm going to be the one to tell you, I'm going to give you all the reasons not to enter today. And if you decide to enter, then enter at your own risk. Um, but doing so, then you won't be surprised. I think it, many times in our industry, unfortunately, you know, if you go to some certain companies or different companies, what they'll do is they'll tell you all the upside and we'll tell you none of the downside. Okay, so my objective is not to sugarcoat it at all, is to tell you what some of the upside and some of the downside, and then to show you how you can overcome that with a certain set of skills or a certain mentality that will allow for you to be successful in doing this. Does that make sense to you guys by a shake of hand? It's a, let's rock. All right, so um, I, I abide by this rule, is learning is, beginning of, learning is the beginning of health, wealth, future, fortune. You can multiply your wealth by two, by three, by five, by 10 if you don't neglect to learn. So I would just write that down. That's kind of good. Learning is the beginning of health, wealth, future, fortune. You can multiply your wealth by two, by three, by five, by 10 if you don't neglect to learn. So if you learn anything from me today, write it down because at the end, I'm going to go around and it's just an FYI, I'm going to ask you, what, did, what is the one thing you're going to take away from our conversation? So if you don't take anything away, you're wasting your time and mine. And I'm not a big believer in wasting time. Is that fair? Cool. All right. So um, let's get after this. So um, Emily asked me to come on and share with you a little bit about how I got in the industry, some of the things that I've learned in the industry, and then ultimately why this industry is good and what NAFA kind of means in the association um, and, and how that that actually solidifies the cause and the why. So I know you've heard from some other speakers that are pretty good. Um, I'm the best guys. I say the best for last. <laughs> I'm just joking. So, so um, now I'm, I'm say that humbly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in greatness, you know, but um, so, so I mentioned, I said, I've been in the business. So when I first started off in the business, um, one of the things that the companies will do is they'll ask you to go out, They'll say, okay, what, how do you think you're going to do? And of course, all of you guys say we're going to win. Just so, remember if you call, I said I was in sports. So we'd all, always start off the season saying we're going to win every game, right? No one starts off the season saying, hey, we're going to lose the game number three by 15 points in overtime, or we're going to lose the game number seven with a, a buzzer beater uh, from half court, right? No one, no one says that, right? We all start off, we're thinking we're going to, to win every game. And that's the mentality you need to have, right? Is that I'm going to be successful at this. I want to do very well at it. And ultimately, I want to kick butt, take names, and I, I just want to crush. And so ultimately, that is the objective for all of you. But if everybody could play professional basketball, don't you think they would? If every good basketball player could play professional basketball, don't you think they'll all raise their hands and say, you know, I would, I'd sign up for the NBA every day, all day. But Everyone, everyone is not capable of doing that, okay? And so what I mean by that is you have to look first, let's decide if this is an industry that we should be in, okay? So I'm going to give you some things to think about for yourself to decide that if you get into this industry, these are things that I'm going to have to deal with in my first couple years in this industry, Okay. This is gold, by the way. It doesn't matter what company you go to, what organization you're affiliated with. It does not matter. This is this is this is the good stuff. Okay, 
So the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to overcome the fear of talking to people. By show of hands, is there anybody here that have a fear of talking to people? Okay. Does anybody here have a fear of actually approaching a stranger, a complete stranger? You don't know them. You know, we live in a we live in a very interesting time, right? Where if you walked up to someone, would someone do this? Would it be like, what are you talking to me for? What is this about? I don't know what you what are you talking to me about? What is that? You know, we live in that world, right? Um, how many people feel comfortable doing that? Okay. So, 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 so the first thing is that, A, we have to, we have to establish the fact that we don't know who we don't know and everybody out there needs our help. Okay. So, so there's ways of meeting those people. Um, the thing we have to get over is the fact that people are strangers until they meet people for the first time. Everyone's a stranger till you meet them for the first time. So if I saw all of you, if I saw any of you walking down the street, I'd be like, hey, you know what? That's Nathan over there. I saw Nathan on. So Nathan is no longer a stranger to me. When they first start off in the business, they're going to hand you something that says, hey, put down all the people you know into a, a group of possible potential clients. Right. Even if you're a junior associate, they'll say, hey, well, who do you know? What are you bringing to the table? Right. So they'll ask you to put down your mom, your dad, your cousin, your uncle, your aunt. Do you know anybody in business? Do you know anybody that owns a business? Do you know anybody who's influential in business? Do you know anyone in accounting? Do you know anyone in this category, this category, this category, this category, this category, this category, and all those different categories? What they're saying to you is no one's going to do business with you if they don't know who you are and what you do. So that means that you have to actually market yourself so that people know where to find you and how to find you. And the only way to do that is by word of mouth. And since you don't have any money and you don't have a company behind you, the only way to do that is you. So you are to the catalyst to the marketing efforts of your business when you start off. So, so the first thing is you got, we got to get over ourselves and understand that everybody's, everybody's out there and doesn't know who I am and they, everybody needs to hear my story. So unless they heard your story for the first time, then it's your responsibility to tell them. We're not going to leave it on to a company or we're not going to leave it to our cousin or our uncle or a letter. Or we're not going to, you know, we, I want to have motto we motto conversation. I want to call Emily up and say, Emily, this is Chris Gandy. Does my name sound familiar? She goes, no, Chris, I don't know you. I said, okay, it's irrelevant at this particular point. I said, Emily, since I have you on the phone, does it make sense for me to tell you at least why I called? Emily says, well, sure, go right ahead, right? And now I tell people, I tell her, I say, Emily, you and I have a mutual friend in common. They mentioned the fact that you and I should get to know each other. I'd like to schedule a time to introduce myself to you. I work in areas of wealth accumulation, wealth preservation, wealth distribution, really helping people make smart decisions with money. I don't know where you are at this particular point, but I'd love an opportunity to share with you who we are and what we do and to figure out if I could be part of your future and help you along the way. Okay, so Emma said, okay, yeah, great. I'd love to schedule a time. Okay, cool. So now we have that. So the first thing is getting over that fear. The next thing is we have to have the ability to articulate who we are and what we do. Okay, I'll give you an example of that. When you pull up to a McDonald's, is anyone ever here eating McDonald's? Don't lie. Someone here is eating McDonald's. Okay, let's call it what it is. Okay, everybody's here is eating McDonald's at least one time. Okay. Um, I don't care how healthy you are, at least once. Okay, so if you pulled up to McDonald's, why didn't you pull up to McDonald's and order Chick-fil-A? Was it because it's not on your menu? Now you can't order Chick-fil-A at McDonald's because they don't serve it, right? But you realize the public believes that actually Chris Gandy does banking. The public believes that because I'm in the finance industry that I do... Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Burger King. Um, I do Subway. I do all these different things. They can't distinguish the difference between an advisor who does insurance, an advisor who does only investments, an advisor who only does fees, an advisor who only does ABCD, all these different iterations of our business. So it becomes super important for your words to be able to articulate very specifically who you are, what you do, and the value you can bring to those people's lives. Okay, so early on, you're going to say, they're either going to A, give you a script, or B, they're going to tell you, you know, 
here's what you say. The, your ability to memorize, organize, and be able to own that script is going to be super important. I can't, I can't express this enough. In sports, they taught us the fundamentals. They taught you the fundamentals first, right? You don't learn how to behind the back pass before you learn how to basic pass. You don't learn how to dribble between the legs before you learn how to dribble a basketball. You don't learn how to shoot a basketball from three from three before you learn how to shoot a layup. Those are the things you learn first. You learn how to pass, dribble, and shoot. In this business, the ability to be able to articulate who we are and our value proposition and what we do is super important. And I can tell you right now, the earlier you can do that, the better off you will become. OK, if you can't describe who you are, if you fumble when you talk, if you do this, if you do this now, you're early on, you're going to do that. We understand it. Right. But repetition is the mother of learning. So the way you learn is you do it, do it, do it, do it, practice, do it, do it, do it, practice, do it, do it, practice, do it, do it, practice, do it, do it. And you keep doing it until it becomes part of who you are and what you do. So now literally you can walk with anybody and say, hey, I'd love to introduce myself. My name is such and such. I'd love to tell you a little bit about who we are, who we are and what we do, right? So it becomes a part, it just oozes out of your skin. This is kind of a cool thing. So our objective is to get to that point. So one, um, we have to start off at the beginning, um, learn about ourselves. Two, and we start to think about just kind of getting the marketing plan going. Two is we have to articulate who we are and what we do. Three is we got to set goals. And what I mean by goals is we got to have realistic goals. So on my desk here, I'm going to share with you guys are the six steps to goal planning. This is gold. So this is actually a kind of a cool thing. I won this at some point in my life where they were like, hey, you're kind of talented. We like you. And I said, cool. I said, I love this book. And there's a book called uh, Think and Grow Rich. It's actually on my desk because I read it all the time. This is the book. I suggest you guys, by the way, you can download this. It's free. You can actually download it online. It's called Think and Grow Rich. And in here is called the six ghosts of fear. And what it does is it describes all the reasons why we give ourselves excuses to fail. Because if we had the ability to see ourselves as really our, the, our, in our struggles, we would actually deal with it and overcome those things. Right. And so when we get done today, I'm actually going to read you those ghosts. So if you use those as an excuse, you've already given up. So you can never use those as excuses ever, 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 because this is the book. This is the secret sauce. This is the one book that I recommend that all our advisors read before they start this business. It is super duper duper. It's called Think and Grow Rich. Notice it says Think and Grow Rich. It doesn't say just get rich. It doesn't say Google rich. It says Think and Grow Rich. So that means thinking drives our actions and our actions drive our behaviors, right? We use less thought now and we just start going, right? So the thing is to start to think. So articulate who we are and what we do. Uh, you got to be a part of a good system and a team. So what does that mean? Um, every company. So here's what the hardest thing that you guys are going to have to decide to do. You got to decide what team to play for. This is the This is the fun here. So there are some teams that are like the New England Patriots, where regardless of who's in what position, you typically can just plug and play. There are those teams. There are teams where they build around your personality and who you are. There are those teams. And there are teams that basically you're just a number and you join the organization. And if you make it, you do. If you don't, you don't based on your natural skill. Right. I think those are so you have your career shop, your independent shop. You have those different places that look something like that. And then you have a career where you basically come in as a junior advisor and then learn along the way. Um, you got to think about who you are as a person. Um, Tyler, can they, can Emily, can they unmute themselves? They can? Cool. Yes. Tyler, I'm going to just go around the room real quick. Tyler, what school do you go to? Uh, I go to Ursinus College. It's a, it's a smaller school right outside of Philly. Uh, I play baseball there and study finance. Cool. All right, an athletic guy. Okay, so stay unmuted for a second. Why did you choose to go to a smaller school versus a bigger school? Um, I like the, the like the smaller community aspect, um, but there also kind of was the the sports aspect too. I like that. Okay, cool. All right, perfect. All right, mute yourself, Tyler. Okay, Nathan. Can Nathan hear me? Nathan, come off mute. Hey. 
Nathan, where do you go to school? I go to University of North Florida. Okay, so you go to North Florida. And why did you choose to go to a, a, a North Florida school versus University of Florida or Florida State? Um, I originally went to a small Christian school in Indiana, and that was not my idea of college. And I got an opportunity to play soccer at a Division One school here in Jacksonville, and I took the opportunity. I probably would have gone to Florida if I had the opportunity. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so very important. Okay. Yuri. Yep. Where do you go to school, bud? I go to the university of Florida. Okay. Oh, you guys are, you guys are uh, in, in, right next door to each other. Huh? Okay. So you're, so he's at the swamp down there. Okay. So why did you choose to go to a big university like the university of Florida? Um, so I actually transferred there. I was previously at the university of California, Irvine. And uh, it was very like a clear choice for me of not only moving uh, closer to home, being in Florida, but, but also kind of a bigger school that had more like school spirit instead of just being, you know, purely academically focused. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Um, Kyle, can you hear us? I know we can't see you. If you can hear us, take yourself off mute for a second. We're just curious about where you went to school. And that, I'm asking this for a reason, guys. Um, Kyle, where do you go to school? I go to school at Drake uh, okay. in Des Moines. I'm very aware with I'm very the the what is it Drake the Dragons I think the Dragons no Bulldogs Bulldogs yeah okay so Kyle why did you choose to go to school at Drake um it was the smaller size I really connected better with it the idea of more personal interaction with the professors and more just interaction in general okay perfect thanks all right Kyle meet you so so if you guys are listening to my voice here's what I can tell you. Don't go someplace where you don't feel like you can play and you're irrelevant. Don't do it. Right. And the reason why I say that is because your development is going to be very important and based around their ability to basically identify the things you need to grow. What Nathan needs to grow is different than what Tyler needs to grow. Yeah, you, what Kyle needs, Yuri needs, right? But at the very basics, you're going to need the basic fundamentals and then just like the NBA, right? There are teams that are different types of teams, even though they're all in the league, they're all different teams. And certain people will thrive better on our certain teams than others. So you have to find yourself, you have to find whatever, it's funny Emily says about Drake. <laughs> um, uh, you have to find the right team where you're a good fit for which the way they go about preparing and winning the games. Does that make sense? Don't just go to league because you're going to the league. Some of you have said, well, I chose the smaller school because of the interaction. Kyle said with the interaction with the professors, I want to be able to actually, you know, feel, you know, and Nathan said, I would go to a bigger school if I possibly could. Right. Um, Kyle, Kyle said, you know, I'm at this school, but I, I enjoy the idea of sports and, and, and mixing it in. Right. So so all of you said something completely different. And so when you're interviewing out there with organizations or thinking about organizations that where you want to go, you got to find the organization that has the best opportunity to help you win championships. Does that make sense? I got a couple of sports guys on here. Like, you know, you understand that, you know, all teams aren't created equal. All coaches are not created equal. <laughs> All of us have played, you know, all of you played sports probably at some point when you were younger and all of you played for coaches that you're just like, I'll be glad when this is over. I'm off this team. <laughs> Tyler's laughing, but he knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? You, you played for guys and you're like, and there's other people you played for where you're like, I'll run through a wall for that person. That person, I, you know what? Let's go get it, right? And they motivated you and they inspired you to do more, way more than what you thought you were capable of doing. You've got to find that in this industry if you're going to come into it. Because that's what's going to make it so that when it's hard and difficult, you're able to overcome those things because they're able to, to give you those things that like-minded individuals like yourself. So you got to find the right team that's going to make sense, make sense for you guys, for all of you guys. Um, you, got, you have to also be able to understand that you're green and growing. So 
here's what I tell every advisor that starts in our business. So right now there's a couple of new advisors that are starting with us. And here's what I told them. I said, you're going to have to work while you learn. See, up until now, you guys have had to get an education so then you can go to the next chapter and then graduate from high school so you can go to the next chapter. Well, here's what I can tell you. Tyler, if you play baseball, you got to learn how to be the utility guy. <laughs> you may have to play a little first base. You may have to pitch sometimes. You may have to. And you, so you're going to have to learn different roles along the way while still performing the basic roles. Does that make sense? So you're going to have to learn and do at the same time. You can't wait till you learn it all. The biggest mistake I see new advisors do is they say, oh, Chris, I need to learn how to do this and this and this and this and this. First. I said, you're going to go broke. You can't do it. I don't want you to go broke. That means we're losing, right? So, so here's how we're going to do this. We're going to set it up so then you're learning as we go. You're being mentored as we go. You're learning the model as we go. We don't, we're not going to order burgers when we're actually at Chick-fil-A. We're going to order Chick-fil-A, right? We're going to do the things necessary to get you to the point where you survive and then thrive. So I'll give you the years. Your first year, your goal is to survive. I understand you want to make money. I get it. The goal of the first year is to make it to the second year. That is the goal. And I'll tell you why. Statistics will show 50% of people that join the financial services industry don't ever make it out of the first year. So if you make it out of the first year, you've already survived. You've already beat the odds. And then you want to survive and learn and then thrive, okay? So year one, survive. Learn as much as you possibly can. Become the sponge, right? You want to check, write down everything, everything and anything that matters. Why? So, so you see on my desk, I got one notebook, two notebooks, uh, uh, three little notebooks because I'm still learning, right? So the, the ability to learn as much as I possibly can. I have this, this, I mean, these are, I didn't plant these. These are like on my desk. If I turn my thing around, like this is like constant juice, Right. And I'm constantly like, okay, ooh, I need to write that down. Oh, I need to write that down. Oh, I need to write that down. So when I start my day, I'm typically like, what am I going to learn today? And then what am I going to use that I learned yesterday today? So you're constantly learning uh, in this business. So understanding that um, is that, you know, if you lay it out, give yourself grace because, oh, here's my other notebook. Um, give yourself grace because you're going to actually do okay, but you're actually going to have to learn along the way. So that's that's the next thing. Um, last but not least is you got to find a family that kind of makes sense for you and decide what you want to be when you grow up. See, the, the thing with this business does is it makes you act 10 years older than you actually are. It just, it is what it is. So I understand that you guys aren't thinking about buying a house in your first month or in the first six months of the business, but we have to act like we are. I understand we're not talking about hiring somebody in our first six months, but we have to act like we are because the clients out there will demand that you do that. The reason why is because this is a very mature business. So when you deal with people's money, they expect you to, if you don't know it, they don't expect you to pretend. They expect you to actually be human and say, I don't know the answer to this. I'm going to go back to my office and work with my team to actually come back and give you the answers. So understanding that that is part of the, that is part of the growth of what you guys are going to have to do. Um, I'm not saying this business is hard. I am saying this business is difficult. I'll repeat that. I'm not saying this business is hard. I'm saying this business is difficult. So when I say that, what does that mean to you? I'm not saying it's hard. I'm saying it's difficult. Kyle, what does that mean to you? I'm not saying it's hard. I'm saying it's difficult. It's not a play on words either. I'm sorry. I was working on something. Uh, could you repeat it? I'm not saying this is business is going to be hard. I'm saying it's difficult. What does that mean to you? It means there are challenges to overcome, but if you are willing to work at it, then it is something that you can accomplish. It's difficult okay. because there are challenges, but it's not necessarily hard because it's still something that you can do. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, Tyler, what does that mean to you? Uh, kind of similar to what Kyle said, I think um, there's a lot of challenges in this business, um, but it's also a business where you can be very successful if you're willing to learn from those uh, challenges and, and continue to grow. Okay. Um, let's, let's flip the script. So, so it's hard. It's not difficult. Uh, so, so here's what I'm saying. There are harder jobs. Think about this. There are people out there that will come out of college and what they'll do is they'll go actually for argument's sake. Um, they're going to be the guys that work in construction and you know what they're going to do. They're actually going to go underground and they're actually going to work on the highway. You guys, you guys, you guys ever been on a highway where they're actually doing construction? And do you see those people that actually work there? A lot of those people have degrees. I mean, there's engineers that actually, and do you see like right now it's like a hundred and a hundred and melting something <laughs> like everywhere. Right. There are people out there working in this weather. There are people that are working. If you're in Chicago, working at negative 20 degrees at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. We're talking about using this and this and this, a little bit of this and this, this and this, like a little bit of heart because you got to be able to overcome. I get it. Yep. You got to be, you got to be courageous. A little bit of this because you got to be thoughtful of what you're doing and a little bit of this because you got to be able to articulate it. It's a little bit of this, this and this. That's it. So we're not having to do this. We're not having to take our physical hands and actually, you know, get scars and, and blood and stuff all over our hands and have to be down there at six o'clock and four o'clock in the morning and actually down there and almost get hit by cars, people driving crazy and drunk drivers and actually be down there and basically at 120, 160 degree temperature and then go home at night and we're soaking wet and we can't even keep our eyes away. We're not doing that. That's hard. That's hard. We're not doing that. We're in the business of helping people. <laughs> and the more people we talk to, the more people we can help. Can you imagine? I just got to have the courage to pick a phone and call this guy. I got to have the courage to introduce myself to this person. I got to have the courage to send this email. Now, is it natural that you just wake up in the morning and say, I want to meet 10 or 15 people today? No. Especially not during COVID. COVID said, don't talk to me. Don't even look at me. You may, I may catch COVID. <laughs> you know, like, remember that? Where if you walk the first time, remember, remember after COVID, the first time you walked outside, all of you, the first time you walked outside, you walked outside and you looked at everybody different. You were like, you probably have COVID and you can give it to me and I can die, right? Everybody did that. Right, we looked at people a little bit differently. Or was it just me? Emily, maybe it was just me, right? But I think everybody kind of looked over their shoulder like in the moment someone would be in a room, even right now still, sometimes if you're in a room and somebody coughs, everybody goes, oh, oh my gosh, right? If someone sneezes, they're like, oh, they're spreading COVID. Like, no, people sneeze, I get it, right? Hopefully they just cover their mouth, right? My whole point in saying that is that you have to be okay with understanding that we are human, you're human, and that you're going to make mistakes. We got that. But again, if you don't learn from your mistakes, then you're just consistently making them over and over and over and over again. Be in a group, be in a firm, be in an organization where you can come in and actually hit the ground running in somewhere where they're going to invest in you and you, you find what you need in that organization and group. Don't go anywhere because they're the ones that are doing all the marketing. That doesn't make sense. Don't go anywhere because, quote unquote, they're going to pay you the most money. Stop it. Stop it. That So what I can tell you is don't chase the butterflies, okay, guys? Like if a company, if a company says to you, Nathan, I'm going to pay you $80,000 your first year, even though I know you don't have any clients. I know you, you, you don't know what you're doing. I know you don't do this. I know you don't do this. I would look at there are things that come with that promise that you don't know what's going to come with it. I'll give you guys the statistics. It's really interesting. There was a study, financial services. So they put a financial service that they, the, the aspects of financial services, here are the things that you need to skill set, you need to be able to do, or here's the things you're going to be able to do in financial services, okay? They put it in a paper. 
and they ran a, a wanted article. The ability to be self-driven, the ability to be able to do this, the ability to be able to do this, be able to do this. And they put in there, you'll make $50,000 a year. And they took applicants for three weeks. Okay. They had over 10,000 applicants for that. They put that exact same job description, did not change a single word. And they put, we'll make half a million dollars a year. And they got 10 applicants. Why? I already called on Nathan and Kyle. So I'm going to go to, I'm, I already called on Tyler and uh, Kyle. So I'm going to go to Nathan for this one. Nathan, why did, why? Why did that happen? I think less people were willing to apply because they felt that the job might have been out of their pay grade. Okay. They, they probably right. think that they, right. they weren't worth half a million dollars. Correct. Yuri, what about you? Yeah, uh, I think just the number, like the total earnings rate, right? people think that, you know, they're going to have to work so much harder to make that money instead of, you know, they see a lower base salary. So they're like, okay, you know, probably not take as much work for me. Uh, Cause I guess the expectations, right? Correct. The expectations of half a million are a lot higher than for 50,000. Correct. Correct. And so the psychology of it. Um, if I'm talking to my two athletes, you know, you understand mental toughness, right? You understand what that is, right? Is when you're actually down and out, how are you going to pick yourself up and how are you going to overcome, even though you may be getting your teeth kicked in, right? So, so the idea of mental, mental toughness in society today, gents, here's the deal. The deal is people have validated in their mind. This is what I feel like I'm worth. That is why there were so many applicants. There's a, there's a preconceived notion that if they're going to pay me more than what I think I'm worth. I have to do more work. Imagine joining a business where you get a chance to kind of create whatever kind of income you want. And what I mean, whatever kind of income you want, I'll, I'll joke, I, I joke about this all the time. I said, you know, my family, and I'm only accustomed, by the way, you're only a byproduct of the people you, you're a byproduct of the things that where you came from, of the things you, where you came from, what you believe, and the people that surrounded you as you grew up. Right. So if your parents, there's also a study out there that shows that your comfort level is within one or 10 to 15,000 of what your normal comfort level has been. So if your parents made $200,000 a year, you're comfortable making 200 to $300,000 a year. That's just your comfort zone. But if your family's never made more than 50 or $60,000 a year as a couple, as an individual, as a couple of hundred, that is your mentality, whether you like it or not, because it was ingrained in us from the time we were two years old and we were little tad tadpoles. It's the reason why you don't go to your grandmother's house and say, how much does that cost? Because your mom would say, that's rude. Don't do that. <laughs> right. And the reason why is because we don't have a tendency to talk about money in society. And so guess what you do? Naturally, you carry that throughout your life. So you don't go around asking people, okay, how much does that cost? How much is the value of that? How do I create enough revenue to be able to do that? How do I create it? You don't go around doing that. And we carry these things with us. And early on in this business, we have to actually take those things out and we have to use those things that kind of motivate us to do other things. So I can tell you this business is wonderful it's great you can make a lot of money and i'll tell my story here in a second it's wonderful it's great you got to be diligent and be able to, to overcome obstacles along the way again it's it's difficult it's not hard right um you got to be able to articulate you got to get out of your own way right and you got to just come in bright-eyed bushy-tailed and be willing to do the extra um i talk about the difference i say people will do ordinary here's a quote for you people will do ordinary things and expect extraordinary results you got to do the extra. The only way you get the extraordinary results is you got to put an extraordinary effort in there. The difference is the little extra, E-X-T-R-A. That is the only difference in those. If you expect extraordinary results, you got to put an extraordinary effort. How many people do we know that says, oh, Chris, I'm only going to work 40 hours a week, but I want to make $20 million? Everybody. If you polled, everyone says, do you want to be a millionaire? Everybody says, I mean, I do. But then when you lay out the work it takes to actually do it, they're like, nah, don't know if that's going to fit my summer plans. No, nah, don't know if I'm going to do that. Uh, and I got other things to do. Chris, what time am I going to get out of here? I don't know if I want to make a million today. So 
So all of you have the capability of doing the business, all of you. You all are all skilled, good looking, good looking gentlemen, and Emily, of course. Um, great, articulate, all of you. You're graduating from fantastic universities. You all have the ability, you all have the can do. Can you do it? Sure. The question really is, will you do it? There's a difference between the can do and will do. So we know you can do it. You wouldn't be on this call if not, um, but the will do. The test is the will do. Are you willing to make the sacrifice necessary to do all the things necessary to have success and survive and then thrive your second in year number two? Well, I see a semblance of all of you in my story. My story is very simple. My family never made my mother, my, my, my family never made more than fifty thousand dollars a year. I went to school at the University of University of Illinois. I'm an orange and blue guy. Um, uh, I played. That's me, by the way. When I was younger, right? um, I played basketball at the University of Illinois. Um, and I remember my mother coming to me one day and she says, hey, if you're going to go to college, um, the only way you're going to be able to go, you're going to have to go to community college. But if not, then the only way you're going to be able to go is uh, you're going to have to do that scholarship thing. And I'm like, OK, got it. Um, so um, I put my mind to it and basically just outworked everybody and had an opportunity to go play basketball at the University of Illinois. My mother still didn't make more than fifty thousand dollars a year. I tell you guys, because my first contract out of playing college basketball. Uh, was with the Chicago Bulls in 1997. My first year in 1997, I made 315, 320, 3, 320. So I'll look up the contract. They, they made $320,000, which is basically, you know, it's what, six times more than my mom had made in a year. I had made in one year. Okay. Got it. Okay. So kind of interesting, but now I'm playing sports. So first year's contract was 315, second year's contract was 265, and then I got hurt, and then my third year contract was 190, and then I was done. Mother's still making, that time she was making like 47,000, 48,000 a year. Um, I then left that and decided to come into the financial services industry. Actually, I came into the industry of, uh, I wanted to be on the radio and on TV, you see ESPN guys. I'm like, yeah, that's going to be me. <laughs> that's going to be on ESPN and doing the radio. So I thought about that and I got into that because I was doing rehab on my knee. It was just a natural fit for myself. Um, and uh, my first year doing that, um, I made a little over $17,000 my first year doing radio. And so I went to go see my guy who was my advisor. And he says, Hey, what are you going to do with your life? And I'm like, I don't know. I think this thing is kind of cool. I'm gonna hit a big show one day, be on ESPN. He's like, mm, okay, great. He goes, what about financial services? And I said, I asked him three questions. So I kind of really just, I was young and dumb and didn't know any better. I asked him three questions. I said, well, wait a minute. I don't even know if I can do that, but I don't even know what you do, but okay. I asked him three questions. I said, one, can I make more than $50,000 a year? He goes, yeah. Check. I said, okay. Number two, where do you live? And he lived in, he lived in a, a subdivision called Cherry Hills. I'm like, that's, that's a pretty nice subdivision. <laughs> Who knew? I, I think I could live in Cherry Hills, right? Um, and last but not least is I asked him, I said, um, what kind of car do you drive? And he said, I have a Toyota Avalon, which is not my practical purposes. I'm like, that's a pretty nice car. And so he said, do you believe that you could go out? He goes, how many times did you shoot the basketball a day? I said, we had to use 500 shots in the morning, 500 shots in the evening, lift weights. We have to do that. He goes, do you believe that the time, that the amount of shots that you took, that you can actually turn around and take that many phone calls? I said, sure. Why not? He said, okay, cool. Um, he, he said, if you can do that, you'll have success. 
So he took what I learned in sports and turned it into and turned it into this business. My first year in this business, um, I made my I was in the business from August until the end of the year, and I made eighty six thousand some odd dollars my first year in the business. My first full year in the business, I made one seventeen. My next year in the business, I made one forty nine. The next year in the business, I made one ninety. The following year in the business, I made three hundred and ninety two thousand. The following year, I made four hundred and seventy one thousand. Within five years, I was making almost half a million dollars a year. Now I had to hire people to help me and do things and build business and stuff like that. But I learned the basic fundamentals. I tell you guys this, I don't know why Emily had me come on because I'm kind of a weird person, but I think she had me come on because my story, whether I don't care where you came from, it doesn't matter how, how good your family is or how wealthy your family is. It's irrelevant. The ability to build this business, I've seen people fail at both ends. The ability to be able to build this business is you got to have fortitude and you got to have guts. You can't, I can't measure that. You got to have guts. You know, that thing that just sticks at you and you're like, you know what? You grit your teeth and you say, I'm going to get after it and I'm going to do what I need to do. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hustle. Every time I get an opportunity, I'm going to prove no one's going to outwork me. That's what it takes to be successful in this business. I wish it was something more exciting than that, but it's not. This business is a wonderful business, but you've got to do you got to you got to do it differently because your peers are going to get paid more early on, but you're getting paid off sweat equity. And trust me, it starts to compound. Notice I said the first year my peers were making more than me. But by year three or four, I was making way more than them. And for the rest of my career, I've been making more than those guys. And I always said, you know, I'm going to make them. I'd love to make a million dollars at this business one year. That'd be fantastic. And that'd be great. Right. Who knew? I mean, who knew? I'm from Kankakee, Illinois, where my mom made like 50 grand a year. And I was like, oh, I'm super excited to make more than that. Um, in year number nine in this business, I eclipsed over a million dollars in one year. In one year. I was the dumb jock. I was the guy that was like, oh, he's just a jock. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. But I was fortunate enough to learn these things that I'm sharing with you from a great mentor. And one of the things he shared with me was this book. He said, man, you read this thing and you read it every day. He goes, you read this and you study it. You know exactly how it works. He goes, because this will change your life. So I'm going to give you guys an excerpt. I think I have a couple minutes here. Um, I'm going to give you guys the, what they call the ghosts of fear. And these are the things that hold us back that keep us from uh, really accomplishing the things that um, we want to accomplish in life, regardless of what they are, whether it's in this career or it's in whatever career you guys may, may, uh, may have. But let me find it. Do you guys have any questions before I read this? And then I'll leave you guys and Emily will close and we'll be good to go. I'll look it up here. Any questions for me so far? Anybody have anything for Chris? While he's looking it up, um, Chris said, oh, got to figure out this basketball thing. So he um, he did already have some natural given talents. Um, just share a picture of me, my boss, and Chris. <laughs> so to put it, to put a little perspective um, on, on Chris, he did have the uh, natural height. Um, Suzanne and I are about right about five foot. So there you go. <laughs> That's funny. You no, know, you know what? You guys are you guys are great. Um, you guys are great. So any, any questions, Chris, for Chris, you know, like challenges. Um, you know, I know you've got you all have had some some good questions um, you know, throughout about, you know making sure that your resume, you know, what types of things to have on your resume, things like that. Any, anything that you want Chris's perspective on that? Chris, what, um, what really set you aside throughout your journey in um, financial services? What really set me aside? I wouldn't let anyone I work with. I wouldn't let anyone I work with ever. That's the deal. I came in and I'm like, I may not be the most talented one. I'm at, I, I've come from the most affluent family. I may not know what I'm going to do when I grow up, but I'm just not going to let anyone outwork me. And so I didn't. 
I still don't. Even my advisors, they're like, dude, you're here till what, sometimes 10, 11 at night and you're here at five or six in the morning. And at the end of the day, it's because you're not going to outwork me. It's just I'm, I'm conditioned that way. Right. I show up early. I'm the last guy to leave. Right? You play sports like <laughs> it's the deal. Right. So when no one else is watching is when champions are made, not when everybody's watching. Right. Um, that's nothing more than you're executing all the things that you learn. Trust the process. I'm sure you guys have heard that if you've been in sports, trust the process. Right. And so if you know you put in the work and you put in the effort at the end of the day, you know, you're going to perform. If you haven't put in the work, then you start to second guess yourself. And the moment you have uh, something doesn't go right, you start to second guess. And in psychology, again, I said here, here and here, right? 90% of it being here. <laughs> like it's, it's, all, it's all guts and heart, man. It, it truly is. I say that's what set me different from, and I had that taste of defeat. I mean, I grew up um, trying to really figure out what I was going to eat. Well, you know, how were we going to, my mom figured, you know, we struggled with like, how we're going to eat every night, you know? So um, the taste of, for me, the taste of um, scarcity and poverty for me was enough fuel for me. I got, I'm never going back there. I had made the decision a long time. I'm never going back regardless of where I came from. Never, ever in life. <laughs> as long as I have the capability of walking, talking, and chewing gum at the same time, I, I'm not going back. And you guys all have that. You guys are, you guys are superstars. I mean, I'm just, I'm just love to see you guys take on gig, jump in and take off and run. I found it, Emily. Okay. So I'm going to read this to you. You guys get this book. This is fan. This book is unbelievable. It'll change the way you think it'll change the way you look at the world. But here it is. It says, some of, our some of our alibis that let ourselves off the hook are very clever. And then a few of them justify, justified by facts. But alibis cannot be used for making money. The world wants to know only one thing. Have you achieved success or what are you willing to give up to achieve it? One of these catalyst analysts, we've compiled a list of commonly used alibis or excuses that people say to themselves examine are you using any of these and if you're using these stop using them immediately because you're already defeating yourself before you even start here you go if i only had a wife or a family if i had enough pull if i had enough money if i had a good education if i had a job if i had good health if i only had more time if i could if i understood people if i made more money if conditions were better around me, if I could live a greater life over again, if I did not have fear, what could I do? If I were only given a chance, if someone else gave me a chance, if other people didn't have it out for me, if that hadn't happened to me, if um, nothing could stop me, if I were only younger, if I was born rich, if I could meet the right person, if I had the talent that some people have, if I dared to assert myself, if I only embraced past opportunities, if I didn't have the nerves, if I didn't have bad nerves, if I didn't keep, if I, you guys don't have, if I didn't keep house and look after the children, if I did have more money, if I only had a boss who appreciated me, if I only, someone only understood me, if my family understood me, if I lived in a bigger city, if I just could get started, if I was only free, if I had the personalities of other people, if I wasn't so fat, if the talents that were known weren't so great, if I could only get a catch a break, if I could get out of debt, if I hadn't failed before, if I only knew how to, if no one would stand in my way, if I had no worries, if I knew the right person or I married the right person, if I wasn't so dumb, if I wasn't so arrogant, if I wasn't so exaggerate, uh, extravagant, if I was more sure of myself, if I'm not, if, if, if it wasn't against, if the world wasn't out against me, if I was born under a different star, if uh, if not so true, what it would be if uh, if I could only work so much harder, if I could only work harder, if I hadn't lost so much money, if I lived in a different neighborhood, if I came from a different past or if I were in a different business or if only someone would, would, would only listen to me. And the greatest of them is this. If I only had the courage to see myself in the way in which I have my faults, I would find what was wrong with me and correct it immediately. And then I might have a chance to profit from the mistakes and learn something from my experience, from others and those who have taken the time to teach me. These are alibis that are fatal 
towards success in the human race. So if you find yourself using those excuses, <laughs> stop it and use that as motivation and, catal and catalyst for the reason why that's not gonna become your narrative. I can tell you that NAFA is a family. We love all of you. We hope that you guys come into this industry and you guys wanna win championships. I like winning. I tell these guys I'm allergic to losing. Like we don't do that losing thing because losing is a learned behavior just like winning is. There's a reason why certain teams consistently win. It's because that's just, that's what we do. You guys are all winners and you guys all have the capability of being future stars, future leaders. The only thing I ask is if you join this industry, you join this association. So then we can teach you collectively, regardless of our company or our company affiliations, you can be around what I call the champions. NAFA is where the champions hang out. It's the hall of fame. There's some fantastic people that are connected to it as part of, as part of the deal. If you're going to join the league, you got to join the association. You join the Realtors Association, you join their association. It's just part of the deal. So you join the industry, get connected to, to us. Emily's here to help you, guide you. I'm here to help and guide you. You guys are looking at hey, interviews and want to do a mock interview, or you're looking at, hey, where do I go? What do I do? Um, I had someone the other day say, Chris, would you do a mock interview with me? I interviewed them and they said, I said, so listen, I was just out of curiosity. Why are you not coming to join my team? They were like, oh, well, I didn't even know you had an opening. I said, could you next? But that's okay. So we did the mock interview. And at the end, he's now going through our process. He's actually going to join our team, which is kind of interesting. But he had called me to help him with a mock interview. So it was kind of cool. So we're looking for talented. I know this isn't my space, but we're looking for talented young professionals who want to who want to who want to kill it. I'm, I'm interested in guys that I can take and make a hundred thousand dollars a year and teach you how to do it. That's the deal. You want to make more? Cool, let's do it. But yeah, that's that's my number. Like we be doing, we're doing six figures, man. Give me seven months. Well, that's, that's, that's the number we'll be hidden. Awesome. Emily, anything else? No, you're fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, you know, and thank you all of you, uh, whether you're listening virtually, um, catching up on demand, or, you know, the those of you who are live with us, um, you know, always awesome to have a great presenter from Chris. Real cut to the chase, you know, here, here's what to expect. And here's, you know, and, you know, appreciate that candidness and, um, you know, the, the challenges that you're posing to, to the students. So very much appreciated. Um, any, any other closing remarks from the students, any, um, comments, things like that question, final questions, hey, um, look, future oh. leaders, NAFA, here we go. Hey guys, just wave for the camera. It's kind of cool. We like, we like these young men. These, this is the future of financial services here. You know, everything's everything's uh, social media stuff, right? And, oh, I know. Now, I'm going to see it on your Facebook feed here in a second. So, <laughs> I'm on it. Um, but no, um, thank you all for your participation. And, you know, we'll be sending out the survey. Um, want that feedback. Um, you know, again, 50 bucks to join as a student for the entire year. That is a steal. Um, and just with the opportunities just to continue to grow and make these connections um, because, you know, come into the family and, you know, whether it's Chris, whether it's me, whether it's JDR, Kathleen, whoever, um, we're going to, we're going to take you along and help you make those connections so that you, you find a place that is, is a good fit for you um, as you enter this industry. Because as we have said multiple times in this, that, you know, all of our speakers have different, you know, they're from different geographic areas, different um, special practice specialties. And that's what NAFA is. It's a huge umbrella. And we're here to help you, support you. And um, and that's one of the really unique things about NAFA. As Chris said, you know, it doesn't matter what company you end up with. NAFA is still kind of that, that apex gathering point where you can share ideas. It's not competitive. I mean, it is competitive, but, but not in a, um, not in our space. Not right. Space. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, you want to every, yes. It's like, oh yeah. You know, I made more than Tyler this year. That's great. Ha ha. But it's, but you still want to see Tyler do well. You know, we want to see everybody do well. And, um, that's and where that's, you, that's, in our world, in our world, we get a chance. Sorry, Emma, we get a chance to reach out to the saying, Hey, and say, Hey, Tyler, share with me some of the secrets 
what are you doing? Right. Because we share, like, if you guys reached out to me and say, Chris, how did you go from like 30,000, 80,000 to like 130 in a year? And at the end of the day, I'll tell you exactly what I did. Like exactly like verbatim. Like you just have to repeat it. Like, I don't have a problem. If you say, how did you go from like a hundred thousand to 300,000? I will tell you exactly how I did it. Like, so there's no, there's, there's no secret. These, these are God, these are God's gifts. They've given them to the world. Right. And our goal is to share those with other people. Um, they're not really your gifts to give like this book. This, these are things that people have put in my life. And so I'm sharing it with you. So it's your responsibility. Once you learn it is to share it with others. That's awesome. That's a great, great way to end. So thank you, all of you. Once again, um, look for the survey. Um, after completion of the survey, that's when you'll get your certificates and things like that. And so um, we look forward to seeing you on our um, membership Monday list very soon with all of your names as new student members. And um, thank you all for your time. Uh, again, feel free, hit us up on LinkedIn, um, reach out to us however you'd like feel comfortable and uh, we thank you for your participation you guys are great love seeing you guys you guys spend 50 bucks at starbucks i already know it gets it's like ten dollars every time you go that's like five times you know spend the money on something like this is going to help you make millions of dollars in the future so love seeing you guys let me know how i can help connect with me on linkedin i'm under christopher gandy if you guys haven't done it while you're on this call connect with me and then uh you know, shoot me a text or an email or something, figure out how to get a hold of me. And if I don't respond, keep sending me stuff like, hey, it's like, Gandhi, you, you, I was on that future leaders thing. Or, or, or actually, the easiest way is actually reach out to Emily and say, hey, would you connect me with Chris Gandhi? Because then I'll pay attention to that. Because we get, as you guys probably know, there's like 10 billion messages on LinkedIn and you can't even get through half of them. But yes, yes. And yes, always follow up with Chris. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Thanks, Thank Chris. You. Definitely be reaching out. All right, bud. Be blessed. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.